Hello, everybody, and welcome to our podcast series where we explore ways to support and empower youth in leading healthier lives. I'm Max McDonald, and I'll be your host for this journey into topics that matter to today's youth. In each episode, we'll dive into discussions about physical health, mental well being, professional development, and more. Our goal is to provide valuable insights, tips, and inspiration to help you live your best life. Through interviews with experts and practical advice, we aim to equip you with the tools needed to make positive choices and create a healthier future. So whether you're looking to become healthier, manage stress, or navigate your path to professional success, join us as we embark on this empowering journey together. Get ready to live well and thrive one episode at a time. Welcome to the Living Well podcast, empowering youth to live healthier lives. I'm Max McDonald. As we immerse ourselves in the vast online landscape, it's essential to uncover the potential risks and protective measures to ensure a safe digital environment. Today's guest is Constable Tim Kaiser. Constable Kaiser has been with the Charlottetown Police Service for 28 years. He has spent 15 years on the PEI Police Association Board promoting the engagement of youth in the community, six years as a school resource officer within the Charlottetown area of schools, and three years as the primary bridge representative working in collaborative effort to help those who are at acutely elevated risk. Constable Kaiser is certified in peer-to-peer support and individual slash group crisis intervention, transformative mediation, let's try that one again, transformative mediation and leadership, and has developed programs assisting youth to navigate challenges that they face. From cyberbullying to privacy concerns, let's navigate the challenges young individuals face and empower them with the knowledge needed to thrive online. Thank you for being here, Constable Kaiser. Thank you very much for the invite, Max. Well, I don't know if you remember this. You were actually at my school, I think in 2013 to 14, something like that. Colonel Gray, good times. Indeed I was, yes. Yeah. So you don't do that anymore. You're not a school counselor or whatever that official role was, a school resource officer. No, we don't have any school resource officers in the schools currently, but uh, that's, that's a resource challenge that we're having right now, but uh, we're looking to uh, uh, have that uh, changed in the near, very near future. Gotcha. Okay, let's jump right into the questions here. How can parents and educators effectively balance fostering digital literacy and protecting young individuals from online threats? Well, there's little doubt as to how much uh, today's youth are engaged with technology, right? We're seeing that in in a big way. It's a huge part of their culture, their life, and uh, Everybody is linked in and connected now. It's important for parents to, uh, you know, to be asked the questions of who are our children talking to and, and to monitor the amount of time that the screen time that they are having. Although uh, being linked in, this is great for information sharing, for research, can provide that sense of belonging, of connectivity. Um, it's highly influential. And uh, we, we, we need to have a balance uh, with the youth that are utilizing it need to have that balance. And parents have to monitor that balance if the youth are incapable of doing that. We talked with uh, previous hosts about uh, sharing online use with, uh, with youth. So if you're a parent with like a young child to help them with their screen use, because it is completely unmonitored. There's no one online on the other end watching what your child is watching. No. Is there, no. Uh, I think most most parents, young people are wondering, is there like a certain age that there would be a cutoff at? Or is there like a certain age where, you, you know, you can kind of leave them to it? Or is that just up to the individual person to make that choice? That's really going to be up to the individual parent. But I mean, you have to gauge it at how old your children are when they when you're providing them with this technology. Um, you don't want to disadvantage your child either. Mm-hmm. But you also have to know what they're looking at and how often they're on their uh, whatever device they're utilizing. Um, you know, we're seeing as early as grade six where the intimate images are being sent. So, you know, right now we will, as we get into it a little bit later on, you know, we are trying to educate youth uh, as to what content is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, and trying to encourage parents to monitor this because it's 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 a bigger problem than just uh, like having the conversation at school in grade six may be too late for some of these children. 
I agree. Um, now, something else I want to talk about is we talk about uh, how parents and educators can balance digital literacy and protecting young individuals. Is there, for a teacher, for example, say like a high school teacher is asking students to do research online, would giving out like a list of resources they could use, like actual specific sites that they want them to do research on, could that help in maintaining that balance? Well, absolutely. And in most cases, that's what you're getting is the teachers are providing the sites that they can go and, and look for information. And, uh, you know, I had uh, children that, uh, that are gone through and are going through the uh, school system. And, you know, in a lot of these instances, the parents are also helping and right. showing where to find the information. Um, that, that doesn't tend to be where the problem lies. The problem tends to be lie in the times where it's it's not for the educational purpose it's the downtime is when they're starting to get into the uh the uh, sites that are that can be challenging and that can cause some issues with mental health later on right so there's yeah that we've talked about free time as well in previous uh in previous po- episodes of the podcast where that's where a lot of the I'm going to use this term a lot just because I've heard a lot so far, but doom scrolling, people who tend to just get caught in a loop of being online and just scrolling online while they're bored. That's uh, where a lot of these issues seem to arise. The the problems that we're seeing, the the specific topics, some of the previous topics also directly related to this, like this, uh, not mindless, but this um, kind of aimless uh, scrolling through the internet causes these, seems to cause a few of these problems. So that's what I'm taking away from that. No, like, I mean, we we see that adults can't regulate it. So mm. when adults are having difficulty regulating, as you say, doom scrolling, and they're just going through looking and aimless, then how can we possibly think that the youth uh, with that 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 don't regulate as well as as an adult right. can can navigate that? No, it's a whole internet thing for all of us. This is the thing we all need to keep in mind for sure. Uh, what are the latest advancements in online safety tools and technologies? Well, some of the things that we're using now uh, for from a policing standpoint, um, you know, for police, when we talk about CSAM, which is child sexual abuse material, when mm-hmm. we're talking about that, um, we work uh, closely with the entities that control the sites. However, in some cases, if the CSAM material or bullying doesn't infringe on the internal policies of that site, then really it's not going to be coming down. So okay. that's that's where you run into those issues. Now, we are seeing some uh, advancement with the new proposed legislation with Bill C-63 mm-hmm. in the federal government where they're uh, putting some, uh, there's more uh, constraints within the act for uh, Online Harms Act mm-hmm. and it holds services accountable. Um, it provides easier access for police to uh, to do their job um, when it comes to safeguarding youth and makes for regulations that children can't be victimized or re-victimized again um, as it pertains to uh, sexual content. So gotcha. there's that's there. And also there's an, a project called Project Arachnid, and that was launched in two, 2017. This project doesn't use facial recognition, but uses hashtag. And so it doesn't necessarily look at what the image is, but it takes things from that image and it scans all of the web for that particular uh, hash, hashing tag. Mm-hmm. And what it will do is then sends out to that those the service providers uh, to remove the image from their uh, site. It'd be pretty big. That's that's a that's a large amount of technology. I know a lot a lot of uh, the workforces at the, some of these companies are dedicated to monitoring content, or at least like very explicit content. So that would be nice to take the human element out of uh, a lot of that. You know, the difficult part of that job would be seeing a lot of explicit material when you don't necessarily have to. So that could be good for people like the, for all people using the site. Another uh, theme we've seen in our podcast so far is the. Um, not hostility, but the lack of, let's say, lack of, lack of care or sympathy for people that are using these, uh, for the people that actually use these services, um, and the limitations of, and the lack of limitations on these services. I guess you're saying there, not a whole lot of um, em- emphasis from them to change any of their services 
to go along with public health or public safety because they're a private company and they don't really need to do that because they make money through a different service. They make money by selling our information. Yeah. To advertise and again, that's like that. Bill C-63 will, will aid in that. But what, what we have to work on is the resiliency piece. And what we're seeing a lot of is, 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 is police and is, is educators. Um, what you're getting is the bullying piece of it all. And that's, that's the difficult one. And I know you're going to get into that a little bit later on when it comes to the mental health side mm -hmm. um, and the difficulty that lies when, when uh, this is uh, when the forms are being utilized in a way to really harass someone and to make false claims against someone and the difficulty that lies therein with police when they're trying to move forward until it becomes a, a criminal matter. It's really difficult for police to get that information and really it requires warrants in a lot of cases to get that information to proceed with criminal code charges when we talk about harassment and whatnot and in a lot of cases the threshold is not there but it mm -hmm. doesn't lessen the impact on the individual right i see what you're saying i understand that this is a multifaceted issue as well with the legal system as well um, especially when it comes to preventing and trying or even trying to seek justice for harm done over the internet um no matter way the way you look at it you're trying to reduce the amount of harmful speech people see on a platform on platforms that are designed just to have things put on them as much as possible by as many people as possible it's a very difficult challenge is there uh any way that these uh technologies mentioned uh uh arachnid or other uh other technologies can be implemented into curricula at schools or into educational curricula in general no now those those are utilized by police mm -hmm. the arachnid and whatnot um, you know, again, there, we utilize things like justice forms and we utilize in order to bring parties that harm has been done to and the person that's responsible for the harm. Uh, when I was in the schools, we did this quite often actually and had, cause usually the harm impacts the whole household and we're dealing with the whole family that's been impacted by the harm that's been done to a young person. And a lot of times this harm that has happened totally outside of, say, a school day makes its way into a school day and really causes issues throughout the entire school for that, for that time period. And there needs to be a way for us to address this. And lots of times we do this through a mediative approach and which holds the person that is responsible to account. And we use we have a youth worker that's that's dedicated to the Charlottetown police, and we utilize her, and we also use the police, and we bring the school because it impacts the school. We bring the parents, and we bring the youth that are involved in the conflict together. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of instances, this is this works very well, because uh, when it comes to internet, a lot of times we don't get to see the harm that we cause. A lot of people are keyboard warriors and sit behind the keyboard and, and it's an anonymous post. Or if we if it isn't an anonymous post, then we don't, again, get to see the harm that ha and the impact that it has on an individual. And once we do see that, in a lot of instances, that leads, uh, there can be a positive conclusion to it amongst mm -hmm. the parties. I see. I didn't I didn't think about the removing the actual screen element or the an, an, anonymity element to uh, we're talking about specifically cyberbullying here uh, and group cyberbullying where you know one person gets ganged up on by other people from their school. Um, I didn't I, I didn't uh, I didn't think about removing that actual online element that putting it into a person and seeing the effect that your actions have can have a you know a very good uh, rehabilitative effect on people. Absolutely. Um, you know, and when we talk about it, it that that's an, there's an education piece to this, too, because the the youth that are using this, as I said, they don't often realize that impact. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a big education component to it. And when we talk about 
education. The police are very involved right now with the educational system. Um, actually, when as you said, when you were at Colonel Gray, if you'll recall, shortly before that, there was an instance where uh, where there was a lot of narcotics being used at the school, mm-hmm. at, at various schools um, around the province, actually. And which led to the uh, the school resource officer coming into the schools, right? And the youth that that uh, that played a part in that the year before, once reintegrated back into the school, um, we were able to talk to them and see how some of the pitfalls that they had, and they talked about things like cyber world, and they talked about how they were influenced Um, and they actually provided a platform for us which led to a program called healthy me and it's what this was it was designed by these students and with uh members of the the guidance services uh from the educational system and with police and with community support and a program was was developed called Healthy Me, which is now implemented in all grade six classrooms in the Charlottetown area and some of the outlining areas. It's also uh, St. John police caught wind of it and we went over and educated them. So it's being used in St. John as well. And one of the components that we talk about um, amongst the coping and resiliency, uh, one of the parts that we talk about is the cyber world and being, being a responsible user of, of uh, the cyber world. And it talks about a lot of the things that we're discussing here today. So mm. we do, we reach out to kids in grade six with that because, uh, you know, the students that we spoke to that were in high school said that it long before grade 12 were they confronted with these issues. And then from that, we also developed a program called Picture This, which prior to the... Uh, Prior to COVID, we were in grade seven, eight, and nine, and we talked about uh, the realities of uh, pictures with sexual content. And we went to every single class, eight officers, and and spent you know a half an hour in each class and answered questions and talked about the realities and and where mental health can go if you become involved in this. I see. Okay, so this is a thing that's being implemented all over the place. Yeah. Can you discuss the psychological impact of cyberbullying on youth and the role of online safety measures in prevention, the ones we've been talking about so far? And again, this is one of the most uh, challenging, difficult subjects today that, uh, that, that educators are facing, that parents are facing, and that police are facing. Again, most sites can be uh, anonymous, as we said before, right? Like most of the sites, you're not going to, you don't have to even say who you are. So what's, what's happening is that you're having youth that are sitting in a classroom or sitting at home and maybe one person's making comment and then all of a sudden you have that pack mentality where other people because they're trying to feel a sense of belonging so it's either going to promote a sense of belonging or it's going to present a isolation or ostracization right is what you're going to end up with when when you're on some of these sites and it's it's extremely difficult. It leads to anxiety. It leads to depression. You know, your self-worth. There's, there's all kinds of things that happen. And, and you know, educators are, are, are dealing with this. Guidance counselors are dealing with this. Um, outside agencies, psychologists are dealing with this. And, and the reality is, is, is lots of times there there may not be the availability of help for the individual like when they want to talk about this so it's important for parents to you they know their their children better than anybody and if they see that their child's struggling it's important to ask those questions as to as to what's going on and why is this going on and and you know like is there is there something that's being said and you know that starts early on with open lines of communication between parents and and children and, and asking those questions and being engaged. I know that, you know, what we see now is it, it, it's, it's a difficult time because we're seeing parents that are, most parents are, both parents are working in the household or 
more than one job even in a lot of cases. So, you know, that time that we used to have in days of old where, where somebody was there and talking with the children and you, by the time you're coming home and you're doing your, getting your house in order and your, your suppers and your laundries and your cleaning and everything else, it's eight or nine o'clock at night. And, and where did you, when, what, what point did you have that conversation with your child about how their day was and what's really been going on and what's impacting them. Right. Um, so that's, that's extremely important. Right. It's important to try and find that time, even if you've got a tight schedule. We've, something else we've talked about in our previous episodes is just how little time some people have in the day yeah. and uh, what to prioritize with that extra time that they have. And speaking to your young people about how they're doing socially is one of those things that could be, that time could be spent on for sure. One thing that uh, what, that I was really surprised at is when we were doing our Healthy Me Talks in the schools, and we talked about, uh, we talked with grade six students and asking them how many followers they have. Some were having 600 to 1,000 followers. Oh, that's a now, lot. that's a lot for a grade six student to have, right? <laughs> like, they wouldn't know that many people. So who's following them? Who's watching them? Um, those, are, those are all important questions. And the fact that they have so many, they're quite proud of that. Yeah. And so they're 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 placing a high high value on on what how people perceive them on social media sites, mm -hmm. and you know as you know your social media sites when we talk about mental health in in a lot of instances when we look at people's social media sites adults included it's a highlight reel of of your life it's showing like you know your vacations it's showing your 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 sleepovers it's showing your parties it's showing your just just your absolute good times but you know or you get the extreme where you're getting the people that are very low and they're looking for 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 ups from the people that like you know to tell them what a good person they are and and that they're not as bad as as, as they think they are and they're relying heavily on that i mean but the day-to-day -day, is not really part of the the social media platform, you know. It's not it's not a big thing to sit there and show a picture of of you and your dad watching the hockey game or you and your mom <clears throat> hanging out the laundry. That's not that's not the or, no. or you and your mom making doing anything together, right? Like that's not the that's not the highlight reels that that we're looking for. No, and it's so novel that it's actually a a trend right now that that. There's a, some social media app you can get that it makes you take a picture of yourself at a specific time of day, random time of day. So you get your, your authentic self, supposedly. Um, mm -hmm. So that concept alone is enough to drive a whole other social media site um, <laughs> for people that are just trying to, uh, I don't know, also do social media, but not as mainstream or something. I'm not really sure what the gimmick is there. I don't use social media myself. I'm just, uh, I got off a while, a while ago. I can't speak for everybody. The first thing I say to students when, when I go into the classroom and do the healthy me is I don't know, and I bet your parents don't know, how they would navigate as well as you do mm. in the current setting that you're involved in and being so connected and so watched and so judged by others. Mm. I don't know how, 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 what the resiliency would have been like back then. I really don't. Yeah. You've got a public side or side of your life that you feel almost obligated to make public or at least trying to be like funny or something. You're some other social, some, some other area, some other social arena to succeed in. <clears throat> and all you do is look around and see other people succeeding. So it's even harder that way. Um, how do you see the intersection between online safety and mental health and what strategies can be employed to create a positive online environment? Again, it's all going to stem back to education and how we educate our youth and how we utilize uh, social media and how we utilize the Internet uh, for positive. Um, and because, again, nobody uh, can feel as as alone as they do when they're attacked on these sites. And we we all play a role parents play a role in knowing their children 
Um, education plays a role in talking about through the health curriculum and talking about good mental health and resiliency. And, you know, we're quite, again, we're quite fortunate that they open their doors and allow us access to have these types of conversations with you. Um, you know, there are mental health teams that are available to talk with youth. There's guidance that are there to talk with uh, youth at the schools, uh, down at uh, student services, and they play a vital role. Um, and it's, it also impacts who we talk to as youth. Because a lot of times, um, the people that, when something's really heavy for, for a youth to talk about, we have to make sure that we're talking to the right person. Um, because sometimes when we place that on the role of one of our peers, place that on the shoulders of one of our peers, that becomes extremely difficult. And then they take on that role. Um, so we have to make sure that, that we're talking to somebody that, can, that, that, that might provide us the help that we need or that can provide us the help that we need. Right. There are specific people <clears throat> who have skills who learn about these things. And while well, it might be a good, a good idea to reach out to your friends as well, they aren't equipped necessarily to handle a crisis, especially something online. So speaking of that, uh, are there any specific policies or initiatives that you recommend to enhance online safety for children and teens? Well, again, and the, the reality is, 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 is from, from my perspective, is that, that we don't enact those laws, we just enforce those laws. So when it comes to, to the, the legal aspect of it and laws, you know, as much as I would love to be able to say that, that, you know, we can't say anything negative about anybody, but that's not the reality because there's freedom of speech and, and you're allowed to, to have your views and your opinions. Um, we have to look at that when, as it pertains to youth, I think that's a different conversation. I think we have to safeguard the mental health of our youth mm -hmm. and we have to be, uh, we have to be diligent. We have to ask the, the questions of what is in the best interest of our youth, because the reality is, is accessing services can be difficult, can be challenging. And in a lot of cases, they might not know where to go to access help or services. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, you know, when in speaking with the youth and we talked a little bit about parents, is that they don't want to put that one more layer on a parent when they know that, you know, they've worked all day, they got so much on their plate now. A lot of youth do not want to have that conversation. So it's important for parents to be diligent and, and keep on having those those open lines of communication and, and let them understand that uh, you know a parent's shoulders are wide and they're big and they're made for carrying those types of issues and 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 that don't worry whatever your issue is that we can get through it together even though the parent might be just exploding inside over what they're, what they're dealing with, it's important for them not to show that because that when they panic, their child's going to panic. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly. important for them to remain calm and to, you know, to really, really show that, okay, well, we can get through this. And, and again, as I said, even though they might be struggling with it, um, the, the, the child's going to take away the actions of the parent in this. Right. And if they're if they're upset, if they're which probably they are, if they're upset or if they're angry or or whatnot, then that's going to determine the next time whether or not the child's going to come and have those types of conversations. But, you know, I, I do like the fact that we are we we are having more conversations about mental health and, and how social media and how different things are impacting our mental health. We didn't have those conversations really a whole lot in days gone by, but we are actively having those conversations with people now and, and people are, are talking about their challenges and their struggles. And that's a, that's a really good thing. Right. These are all good things. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to talk about that we haven't talked about so far? I just, again, I just think that it's important that the education piece and the resiliency piece, I guess, just not to put so much emphasis 
on what others are saying about us on the social media sites is mm -hmm. extremely important for, for youth <clears throat> and for us to know ourselves and to know our own self-worth and to take our self-worth from the people that matter to us and that are that are actively engaged in our lives. Hmm. That's true. That was this was the thing that was at, that was echoed in a previous episode as well. Take your meaning from the people that are close to you, not from the internet. Gosh. I mean, it's, yeah. I don't want to go into too big of a limb there, but I think that's a pretty solid piece of advice for anybody. Take yourself with the people around you, people close to you. Yeah, for sure. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. And uh, if your words can reach some youth, that'd be great. I think, and I think this puts a podcast with its ultimate goal is to get some experts words out there for young people to hear. Well, thank you very much. And I hope you have a great day.